Okay, thanks for joining us, everybody. Um, we have Dr. Uh, Suyi Lee from the uh, Mechanical Engineering Department here uh, with us today. Uh, uh, PhD out of University of Michigan, and then it was at uh, Clemson University. Which us who are football fans and ACC fans, we won't. Let's leave it later. Yeah, we'll leave, leave that for another discussion. But uh, for today, uh, yeah, we have an interesting thing about uh, uh, structures to talk about. So without further ado. All right, thank you. Thank you. Let's have some fun and talk about origami structures. And so my topic today is uh, dynamics, dynamics under the boat, using origami principle to architect better structures, soft robots, and the intelligence. And uh, I think all of you are familiar with the idea of origami. Um, it's a Japanese word, and ori means fold, gami or kami means uh, paper. And then the original idea of origami is pretty straightforward. You have a piece of paper, you fold it according to some crease pattern, and you can turn that into a three-dimensional shape, like this is a very famous paper queen right here. Origami has a very long history. Uh, the earliest documented history of origami came from Japan, and that was about 400 years ago. That's why we have the Japanese word for this art. And this is actually a, a painting from 1896. You can kind of grasp the history from origami from painting like this. And if you look at this one carefully, uh, those paper green, paper green that these Japanese girls were folding uh, more than 100 years ago, they look exactly the same as the paper green we fold today. So throughout the majority of the long history of origami, it remains more or less the same in terms of design and folding techniques. But that started to change after World War II. So we had a group of very wonderful origami mathematicians and artists who came up with new folding techniques as well as the mathematical theory for folding. And from their work, we saw explosion in terms of this beauty and complexity of this Asian art. So this Wai robot and the Hermit crab, they're actually both folded out of one large piece of paper, as you can see in the crease pattern over there. And this is done without any cutting or gluing. So this is actually very cool uh, stuff they can do with the, these kind of uh, new techniques for folding. And you could imagine when people see things like this, it's very easy that origami can, can start to attract people's attention in all different kinds of fields of study. So very quickly, origami become a popular subject study in art, in education, in architecture, science, and engineering. So let me show you some examples of origami used in engineering. And because it's a space center, I have to show an origami solar panel from somewhere. This is actually a design but done by a group at BYU at NASA. And this idea is that they want to use a folding pattern called flasher, as you see in this animation right now. And then the idea is, of course, you can fold that into a small cylindrical volume to fit into a rocket launcher and then deploy that in the space. And this is a very, very large scale origami structure. You can have a smaller ones. So this is actually a self-folding robot that can fold in response to heat and it can use external magnetic field to activate that robot. So it can start to move around and start to carry some payloads, uh, going up the slope or even uh, swimming in water, like you see right here. And the idea is that they want to use this kind of robot to, drug, uh, to use that for drug delivery in human patient's body. And I can show you one example of something that's closer to your daily life. This is an origami kayak you can buy online right now. It's about two solid dollars, kind of expensive. But the idea is that you can fold this kayak into a small volume so it can fit into, say, the trunk of your car or maybe the checking check luggage for your flight. And then you can bring that to the most remote corner with ease and then deploy that you know, at the spot. So uh, I want to use these examples to show you that origami has been and will continue to shape our modern life in many different ways. And I'm very confident that you're going to see more origami inspired product in your daily life, like the recently very popular affordable phones, affordable furnitures, or even origami clothes. Some of them on sale, I can see uh, origami clothes on sale right now. And then, but I also want to show you by this example that when I started my job at Clemson University it was like six, six and a half years ago, the scope of origami research has been limited to the kinematics only. So that is the people only look into, people only use the geometry of folding to achieve their functions without thinking too much about the material deformations, the stress strain relationships, or the dynamic responses coming from the folding. 
So this is where my research come in because it turned out that origami is not only a very powerful method to create beautiful shapes, it is also a very powerful method to create unique and even unorthodox mechanical properties. So I'm talking about mechanics and dynamics right here. So let me show you one example of what I mean by folding induced mechanics and dynamics. I have this one right here, this example. This is actually, this one's called a mirror ori. This is a very famous origami folding pattern. That was you know, designed by uh, Kira Miura from Japan back in 1960s. And this is actually originally a design for uh, packing lots of small solar cells into a small volume without bending the cells. You can see that as we fold and unfold it, all the surface remain flat and deformed. But you can treat this mirror already like a uh, material, and you can see it has a negative Poisson's ratio. Because if I stretch this way, it actually expands in the perpendicular directions. So this is a classical response of a material that has a negative Poisson's ratio. But if I bend it, maybe like this way, you see it has it will take a saddle shape. And this is a classical response from a material that has a positive Poisson's ratio. So this mirror already has this very peculiar combinations of negative Poisson's ratio in plane and positive Poisson's ratio out of plane. And this is all because of this beautiful tessellations of creases and surface right here. So this study was published in 2011, so small more about 10 years ago, but that become the inspiration of my research. So when I started my job, I started to ask myself the big question. One is that besides this Poisson's ratio, can I use folding to achieve other kinds of interesting mechanical properties? Not just static properties, but also dynamic properties and dynamic responses. And two is that if we can find this folding induced mechanical properties, how do we use that for engineering innovations? So the vision that brings to the vision of our research over the past six years, we're still doing this, is to complete this paradigm shift from just using the kinematics of origami folding to also harness the dynamics and the mechanics and use that to make new structures, metal materials, and soft robots. So with that vision, I'm going to talk about three sort of projects that we uh, we worked on over the last few years. Uh, this is our dynamic side. So I'm going to talk about the dynamics of vibration side of my research portfolio, about how to use origami dynamics to architect meta structures, soft robots, and intelligence. So the three projects I'm going to cover today, the first one is about uncovering the dynamics and vibration inside origami. We talk about how we start this whole field of this origami dynamics and the vibration. The second project is a little bit related to robots, especially soft robots. And we'll talk about how we can use the mechanics of origami folding to achieve soft robotic control without using any digital controllers. So we are controlling in the mechanical domain, not electronical domain. And the third project is kind of the combination of spin-off for the first two projects. It's about how we can uh, explore the computing power hitting behind origami's nonlinear vibrations so we can make a structure that's intelligent in the mechanical domain. So that's a three topic I'm going to cover today. And let's start from the first one, the dynamics and the vibration of origami. And uh, this is also want to give a little bit of history of how I started this whole research field that I'm doing right now. And um, the reason we want to do origami dynamics and vibration is that traditionally speaking, people have been looking at origami as a static problem. Like you start from a static object, like a piece of paper or solar panel. And once you fold it, uh, the final product is also a static object, just leave it there. So my group is one of the first to look into the dynamic responses of folding. And we see how we can use that folding dynamics for different kinds of applications. So I'm kind of still, we can say that we are still sort of the leader in this field right now. And uh, we find two different ways to use folding for dynamic applications. One is that folding can be used to create and control periodicity. And then we can use that for tunable wave propagation bank app for noise control and acoustic for, uh, noise control. And the other one is that we can use folding to generate nonlinear stiffness and then we can use that for control, rapid actuations of robotic locomotions. And today I'm going to focus more on the first half 
uh, about the controlling periodicity. And uh, all of this kind of study kind of happens when I was about to move from Michigan to Clemson, from a very cold place to a very hot place here, right here, it's right in the middle, it's perfect. Mm -hmm. um, but when I was about to move, my lab mates back in Michigan, Minaj, he showed me this graph out of his research. So if you're familiar with acoustics and stuff like that, you might be familiar with this. This is actually a dispersion relationships of acoustic waves, sound wave, propagating through different kinds of lattice structure right here. So the horizontal axis of these plots are the wave vector. They are the orientation of the incoming acoustic wave. And then the vertical axis, the frequency, and the four different plots right here, the other results corresponding to four different kinds of lattice structures. Now the rectangular lattice, square, hexagonal, and center rectangular, and they all have very unique symmetry properties. So what Menage is really interested in is this orange band gap right here, or orange band right here. And let me use this. And uh, these are the range of frequency where the acoustic wave or sound wave cannot propagate through these lattice structures at all because of a Bragg scatter. And uh, this is a very useful phenomenon for acoustic control, wave guiding, or many other interesting phenomena when it comes to you know, vibration acoustics. Now, Menage has a pretty good idea that if you have different you know, lattice structures, you're going to have different bands at different frequencies. But what's really troubling him at that moment is that he could not find a way that can like transform these lattices in between different configurations very easily and efficiently. Because if he can transform the lattice between different kinds of symmetries, he can start to change the frequency of these band gaps. And by doing that, he can open up lots of new interesting applications. So he showed me his graph to me and kind of don't know what to do. And then I thought about it for a while and I realized that I can use overtime to do this. So I proposed this kind of structure to Minaj. Uh, so this, in this kind of a sandwich-like structure, the gray colored face sheets, they are the mirror or the semi mirror or I showed you already. And then the red colored cylindrical structure, they are rigid lattice inclusions attached to the vertices of this origami. So here the vertices means the points where the different fold lines meet each other. So right now the origami is flat and unfolded and I can play with the design of origami so that these lattice inclusions take a sort of hexagonal distribution. But when I start to fold, the lattice will have to follow the motion of this origami vertices. And you can see that at some critical moment, we can transform that into a square lattice with a complete different set of symmetry. And then I can keep folding mm -hmm. and then I can end up with another hexagonal lattice, but with a lot more denser kind of volume. And then can keep folding and it'll end up with a non gravé lattices, but then still have some periodicity going on inside. Now, the key advantage of this is that the mirror ori is rigid foldable. So even if you made the facet out of rigid materials and the creases like hinges, they can still fold smoothly. And because of this, folding has only one degree of freedom. And that makes, in principle, I only need one actuator input to move all of these lattice points synchronously. And that's a very e efficient way to do lattice reconfiguration. So Manash saw this and he's really excited. And so we decided to uh, put this into a uh, theory and we calculate the band gap structure, you know, acoustic band gap structure from the fold. So this is the horizontal axis. That means the folding angle. That's the amount of folding I'm doing with origami. And the vertical axis is the frequency. And then this orange and purple bands, that's orange and purple, that's Clemson color. I need to update that to, to, uh, later, I'll do that later. Um, but these two markers, they are actually the upper and the lower bounds of acoustic bands, acoustic band gaps. So you can see that at low folding angle, you have a small band corresponding to that hexagonal distribution. But when I fold to this critical B point where you have a square lattice, the original band gap disappeared, but two new ones showed up. So you, indeed, you can use folding to reconfigure lattice, and then we can use that to make the band gap to jump to different frequencies. And also, you can see that as my folding angle increases, the band gap gets wider, 
And that's because as I'm folding, all the lattice will kind of come kind of close to each other. So that increase the volume fraction ratio of these lattices. And then we have a wider band gap out of this. Now, this is only sort of showing the transformation between hexagonal and square lattices. Like I showed earlier, we have you know, all kinds of different Bravi lattices, but it could just by uh, changing the design of mirror ori, you can achieve uh, reconfiguration between all different kind of lattice structures. So there was lots of flexibility in terms of design. And Manaj was really, really excited. And then right after that, he actually made a whole structure by himself. Uh, this is actually a physical prototype with lots of like a PVC pipes connect to a host uh, origami structures. And he was able to uh, experimentally prove that you can get those bang up jumps by folding origami. And we like this idea very much that we decided to turn it into a patent. So this is a patent we just get issued last October. And the patent, the title is Adaptive Origami Sonic Barriers for Traffic Noise Mitigation. And then the idea is that you know, if you have this kind of origami based uh, traffic, like highway uh, traffic noise barrier, which looks appealing and also more effective uh, and more lightweight compared to the traditional way of controlling traffic noise. So this is, uh, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, lattice reconfigurations with origami for uh, you know, noise control. Now, some of you might realize that I have to get, I have some asked me that question very early on, like, this is very cool, but at the same time, uh, it, you might have, you still have to assemble lots of, you know, lattice inclusions onto origami structures. It's very intensive in terms of fabrications. They might get very difficult if you want to make it very small. So about two years ago, I asked my student, uh, at Clemson to say, can you come up with a different method? Something that's more easier, scalable, and easy to fabricate, but you can still use the same idea of origami to achieve that band gap control. So that's a question I gave to my students and he started to think about it a while. And then essentially what he came up with, the answer that he came up with is kirigami, rather than origami. So kirigami, is another kind of, it's a variation of origami that kind of allows cutting on top of folding. So kirigami, just like origami, is also a very, very popular method to create beautiful shapes out of like a piece of paper. So this is one of the artwork done by uh, Joseph at University of Michigan. Uh, he's a like artist, artistic student, um, but you can use kirigami to make materials. So for example, you can take a plastic sheet over there with cross cuts and you can stretch it and induce out of plane deformations and bucklings, and you'll end up with this kind of three dimensional and periodic structure. The nice thing about kirigami compared to just pure origami is that it's a very scalable fabrication process because cutting, you can cut you know, different materials at different size easily. So you can cut a really micrometer scale kirigami out of a piece of graphene and they behave very similar to a much larger kirigami piece cut out of a piece of paper as like a soft mechanical spring. So I asked myself, my students, uh, can we use this kind of stretching and cutting of kirigami to generate and control periodicity and also use that for wave propagation bank gap control? And the idea is like this. We can start from a simple materials, piece of metal or plastics. We're gonna cut it with this kind of slick cuts and then we can stretch it enough so they can induce outer plane deformation like this, and it will end up with a three-dimensional and periodic structure like that. Now, for this case, rather than using acoustic wave, I'm going to send in transverse elastic wave, so solid wave in this case. It's so like a vibration of solids. Can we still get band gap out of this? And more importantly, can we control the bank up frequency just by stretching the cube a bit further or less? Because it's a very easy way for us to control bank gap. Now to answer that, we have to solve this equation. This is a governing equation, a very classic Euler-Benin equation on the Kirigami structure, where uh, the U is the displacement field of the you know, transverse displacement from, a Kiri, uh, from the wave. And then IX and AX, the two here, they are the distribution of the cross-sectional areas and also the area moment of inertia of that you know, kirigami structure. 
It turned out that calculating ix and ax, ix and ax, are pretty hard because if you look at the picture right here, the Kirigami has these very complex curved surfaces, and they are at a very difficult angle. So my student, they have to come up ways to simplify the geometry of Kirigami, and they did this by introducing folds into the Kirigami, and then assume the surface in between the folds are flat. So they kind of simplify the geometry into something like this. And by doing this, they can transform that kind of complex buckling deformation of Kirigami into a rigid foldable magnetism again with only one degree of freedom. And more importantly, if you look at this one, a unicell inside, the cross-sectional area, which is like this solid and dashed lines right here, they are straight lines. So that means it's very easy for us to come up with closed form solutions to get AX and IX as you see right here. And the different lines uh, in the plots represents the result from different amount of stretch. And then we can combine this, we can plug in AX and IX back into the governing equation, use plane wave expansion method to calculate the band gap. And we can compare that to experiment. So this is experimental setup. We just have a very simple nylon sheet. We cut it and stretch it. And then one end is attached to shaker. The other side is on the free boundary conditions. And then we use two laser vibrometers to uh, point at the two ends of the Kirigami. And then we can measure how much wave is propagated through the Kirigami structure at different frequencies. This is the case of we're still back in Clemson when they have two single points. Uh, when we moved here, we find that we, uh, we got you know, lots of scanning ones, which is a lot more fun. Um, but this is the result we get. So the horizontal axis, the frequency, the input frequency of the wave, the ver vertical axis is the transmissibility. It tells you how much wave is transmitted through the structure. I have two different plots right here. They're the same thing, just two different scales. One's in dB, one is a linear scale. And the black line in two different plots right here, they are the, uh, the result from FEA. The orange line right here, that's the experimental result. And the purple box is the predicted band gap from our theory. So you see there was a pretty good agreement. And uh, we like this a lot because in the experiment, the Kirigami still have this kind of very complex curved surfaces. So that means our theory with that simplified design, a simplified geometry can still give us a pretty good sort of uh, um, prediction on the band gap. And also if you stretch the Kirigami a bit further, you can change the bank frequency pretty significantly from you know, 400 to 600 all the way to 500, 800. And then, so that means folding us or cutting and stretching is a very good way to create and control bank gaps. And you can summarize this kind of versatility in a plot like this, where the horizontal axis is uh, the stretch, the vertical axis, the frequency, and the three bands right here, they're the frequency of the, the, the bank gap frequency of three different Kirigamis with different designs. So they have different lengths in terms of cuts. So you have lots of freedom just to determine what is my bank gap frequency by designing a Kirigami and also controlling the stretch. So there's lots of good uh, versatility about there. And also, just back in the summer, this is a brand new result. Uh, my student also find out that this kind of Kirigami is not only stretchable, it is also multi-stable. So here I still have the Kirigami structure with its you know, transmissibility, the line, the solid line experiment, and then the like block right here, that's the predicted band gap. But for Kirigami structure, you have lots of units inside and you can actually switch the units to a different stable state with a different shape. So for convenience, I'm gonna say the original Kirigami has lots of zero units. And if you switch one of them into a different shape, it's going to be stable over there. We can call this one and have a different shape. And then if you have lots of origami, a lot of unit cells in the Kirigami, then you have all kinds of different ways to program or sequence and deal with the ones. And when you do this, it's almost like a digital number, binary numbers. When you do this, you can change the underlying periodicity. And as a result, the band gap starts to jump to all different places. So we call this kind of programming. It's almost like you're using the you know, binary number to program the value for numbers. So and we're using a binary input of the diff these different kinds of cells in the Kirigami to program the band gap structures. So this is another way for us to control the band gap in the Kirigami structure.
So this is actually where we were at in terms of acoustic vibration. This is actually, if you go to my lab, the right half of my lab is going to be the vibration acoustic, and this is going to be like what's going on in the right half. And uh, we do have other things uh, going on with, you know, uh, nonlinear with vibration. Like I said earlier, you can also use origami to generate nonlinear stiffness. For example, we found a way to inflate origami structure to create a quasi zero stiffness. And then we can use that for vibration isolation at a very low frequency. And we also find a way to use origami to generate a strength softening stiffness. And then we, we can use that to make a jumping sort of almost like an origami robotic leg that it can jump higher and longer compared to a linear screen. And then we also find a way to use a multi-stability to fold origami use vibration when I'm using static force. So you can just vibrate at the origami at a, at a certain frequency and you can fold it to a different shape. And that give us a very high response speed and also actuation authority. Uh, I don't have time to talk about this today. If you want to talk more, we can chat more. But then I do want to kind of move on to sort of the left half of my lab, which is going to be robotics. So we're going to talk about an example of how we can exploit the mechanics of origami to facilitate soft robotic control without using the controllers. So this is in the field of soft robots. And if you're familiar with that field, soft robots, they are robots made by soft materials, like you know, rubbers, elastomers, things like that. And because they are soft, those robots are very, very versatile. Like this four-leg robot can actually squeeze through a crack beneath the window very easily. And this is a soft robotic finger that can manipulate delicate marine life without damaging those lives. And soft robots are also safe to work with humans, like you see in this robotic rehabilitation glove. But, you know, as the softness gives the robots lots of advantages, it also imposes a very significant challenge for control. So if you look at this example again, the one on the left, I have a robot made of, this is made by PDMS material, very soft, like a rubber. So by definition, this robotic body has infinite degrees of freedom for deformation because it's soft and gluey. But you only have four pressurized chambers as input. So you're dealing with severely underactuated system. The control input has a lot more less degrees of freedom compared to the robotic body. And also the soft materials has usually very complex and nonlinear material properties. So that all makes it very difficult for us to control a soft robot precisely. And people has been using, kind of trying to deal with this kind of challenge in a passive manner, I will say. They will just take the robotic body or robotic design as it is, and they will try to come out with high fidelity models or very advanced you know, control method to compensate the challenge of controlling soft robot. But we want to do it in a different manner. So we don't want to see the softness as the enemy for control. We want to use the softness as a facilitator for control. So can we directly design the softness in the robotic body and use those softness to achieve robotic tasks without using the controllers? So that's what we want to do for this project. And uh, I'm going to show you one example of how we can do that. Uh, this is actually a uh, project inspired by the earthworm. It's a very wonderful animal. Uh, one of the most popular animal in my lab. And uh, the other one is elephant. Um, and then this earthworm, uh, uh, let's say, you know, it has a very nice locomotion method called peristosis. And uh, if you see the earthworm, it has its body has lots of small segments. So when the earthworm wants to like borrow through the earth or navigate through complex environment, it will use its muscle to activate some of its segments, increase their radius, and form an anchor between the earth's own body and the earth you know, surrounding that. And then it's going to coordinate the muscle activation of these segments to propagate that anchor towards the rear end of its body. And as a result, the earth gets pushed forward into the earth. So this is peristosis. And the engineers have been trying to make their own version of earth's own robot for quite a few decades. This is one of our results from a recent study from a colleague, my friend. So just like a real earthworm, you can also make a earthworm-like robot that have lots of segments. And then within each segment, you can have an actuator. In this case, it's just a step motor inside. And then you can use a controller to coordinate these motors so they can mimic 
that peristalsis locomotion gate, like the Earth one. This is very cool, but we're dealing with very complex mechatronic setup because you have lots of motors you know, because you have you need to have one motor in every segment and you have to use controllers electric controllers to coordinate this motor activations so it will make it very difficult for me to make the earth small smaller or softer so we start to ask ourselves can we fold a crawling robot that does not require us to individually actuating and controlling these segments but first we have to find a way to or find an origami foot pattern that can be folded into a shape of a like an earthworm body. So we look around, and what we landed on is this crescent origami. Uh, that's you see the picture right here. I forgot to bring one with me, uh, but it, this picture is pretty clear. So I guess right here, and the crescent origami. This is actually discovered or designed by Berita Kressley. She's an origami artist from France, and this is actually a video of her showing the origin of crescent by herself. And you want to look at it very carefully and uh, hopefully it'll play. And you need to look at it very carefully and not blink your eyes. You get it? So the idea is that if you have a cylindrical shell and if you compress it and twist in just the right way, that shell will collapse by itself and naturally form that origami pattern for you. So this is the origami sort of designed by the mechanics of uh, collapsing in structure. And if you open this one up, you can see the crescent is made by a line of triangular facets. And uh, the crescent has a very nice property. It's called bistability. So a modular crescent can either settle in this compressed state, we call it state zero, or extended state, state one. And you can just switch back and forth just by folding it. And this is coming from the kinematics of folding. So it does not matter what kind of material you're using to make crescent. It could be paper, it could be plastic, it could be, this is metal for this case. You can always get bistability reliably. And the strength of the bistability is directly related to the different design parameters inside. So we were able to kind of make a connection between the design of crestling and the strength of bistability and design the locomotion gate out of this. Uh, let me skip a few slides over here because I want to leave some time for the discussion, but this is what we end up with. Um, so we decided to put two crestlings of different designs together. It's just made up of a piece of paper. And then we're going to put this thing into an Instra machine, and we're going to increase and decrease the overall length of that assembly and see what we can get. So in the two plots right here, the horizontal axis of the two plots are the total length of the structure. L1 is the length of the red colored crestling. L2 is the length of the green colored crestling. And then if you start to increase the total length, so you see the green colored crescent being stretched first, and then the red crescent will follow. But then at a critical length, you're gonna see a jump in the structure, something like that, a quick jump. And that's because of the non-monotonic displacement curve because of the you know, bistability, because you're switching between different stable states. If you start to compress it, well, the green one can be compressed first. And then you're gonna see another jump at a different length, like that. So, and then out of that, this is the deformation sequence you can see. And out of the deformation sequence, you can see a cycle showing up. It's like a driving cycle from A, B, C, D, and back to A. And then you can really reliably repeat that cycle just by increasing and decreasing overall length. So what we could do, it that we can divide that cycle into four different phases and design the locomotion gate out of this. So that's how we can do it. So at the beginning, we're gonna attach a couple of anchors, just like a small extra materials that's glued to the surface of this crescent origami. And then at the beginning, the robot is anchored at its rear end over here. And then the first phase is that expansion or extension you saw in the experiment. So right now the robot is anchored at the left end or the rear end. So if you extend the whole structure, it will just start to move from left to right, like this. The second phase is the first jump you saw in the experimental video. And then we can use that jump to quickly retract the anchor at the back and deploy the anchor at the front. And as a result, you can switch the anchor location from the rear end of the robot to the front end. 
the third phase is the compression you see in the middle of the experiment. And right now the robot is anchored at the front. So if you compress its lens, that means further locomotion towards the right. And then the last phase is the second jump you saw in the experiment. And then we can use that jump to switch the anchor location back to the left end of the robot again. So when you complete the four different phases, you complete a locomotion gate out of this. So in the whole process, I'm only increasing and decreasing the global length of the whole thing, rather than trying to individually controlling and manipulating the robots like in the traditional robotic system. Right? So this is what we get in the end. We used, we on purpose, we did just use very simple papers because once you see we can make cheap robots out of this, but we use a stepper motor plus spring to achieve that increase and decrease in total land. And you can see that whenever the jump happens in the press lane, there was a switch in the anchor location as well as you know the 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 the, the body elongation coordination. So this is the case we're seeing. We are using the mechanics of multi stability to sequence the anchor movement and body elongation. We're not using any specific controllers. So in a bigger idea, it's like the robot is being controlled with mechanics rather than electronics. It's almost like we're getting some kind of intelligence to the robotic body. And so that's why we call this like mechanical intelligence. And because of this, this paper went all the way to the front cover of the journal. So uh, we were really proud of this result. Now, so this is kind of what I have so far, the two different projects. So it's actually the two projects earlier in my career. We're looking to the vibration of origami. And with that, we kind of open this whole field of origami dynamics and vibration. And also we look at how we can use mechanics of robots, of mechanics folding to achieve control without the controllers. And with that, we kind of have this new idea of intelligence in the mechanical domain. But these two projects still have big questions to be answered. You know, on the vibration side, we need to find out how we can use vibration dynamics to do, to do more things. And on the robotic side, we have to find out, can we make that sort of mechanical intelligence more capable, more than just generating locomotions? So as we start to think about that, we realize that it actually makes more sense to combine these two big questions together into one question and answer them as one. So this is, that's, that's bring us to sort of the current project we're working on a lot right now is to explore in the computing power hidden behind origami's nonlinear vibrations to do intelligence. So here, the idea of computing, uh, it's not like a traditional computer, it's called, it refers to the idea of a reservoir computer. So let me show you what that means. So reservoir computer is actually a branch within the field of artificial neural network. So uh, just like any other artificial neural network, a reservoir computer also relies on the dynamics of a high dimensional and nonlinear neural network as the computational resource. But the key difference between the reservoir computer and other artificial neural network is that during the training process, the neural, net, the neural network itself, they do not change. It's only the readout signals connect to the different every neurons. These readout weights are being trained and you know, optimized to get the you know, better result. And because of this, a neural network is called a reservoir for this case. And because the reservoir does not change during training, it's possible for us to use a mechanical system as a neural network to do computation. So for example, rather than having this like nonlinear neural network, I can replace it with a network of masses connected by nonlinear springs and use this mechanical vibration to do computation. So we can use that the vibration of the mass spring network to achieve Boolean uh, logic operations. We can use that to emulations and then we can use that to do text recognition even. So basically that mechanical system itself is the neural network. So it's like a physical neural network. And then we think origami is a very ideal candidate to become a reservoir because it's inherently nonlinear because you have like folding geometry, you have sine and cosines going on inside. And also it's high, it's high dimensional because you have lots of creases and patterns. So we ask ourselves, can we use origami as a reservoir 
and harness computing power to achieve more advanced mechanical intelligence. And this is what the third part is about. But first, first, we have to prove that a origami can be a reservoir computer. This one can be a actual a, a physical neural network. So we did experiment with Smiori again on the emulation task. So in this experiment, we just put a you know, get very simple mirror Ori on the shaker, and then we're gonna use that shaker to generate some kind of nonlinear vibration in origami structure, something like this, very simple. And then we have green colored markers on this origami wedges right here. And then we're gonna use the image process program to extract the displacement of every markers in uh, this origami. And we're going to use this vertex displacement as a reservoir state, so that's the state of a neural network. Here's one example. So the horizontal axis is the time, and the vertical axis is the displacement. And different lines right here, that's the pixel displacement of every green markers or vertices in the origami neural network, in the origami structure. Now comes the important part. We're going to calculate the output of this neural network by adding the reservoir states together. And we're gonna do this by a weighted linear summation as defined by this uh, equation right here. So SI, these are the displacement of this you know, reservoir states and WI, so W1 over to WN, they are a weights or readout weights assigned to every reservoir states. And you get, you add them together, you get the output Y star. And the training for this case involves using linear regression to find the values of these readout weights, find the values of WI so that the output Y star can emulate the dynamics of a completely different nonlinear system as defined by this governing equation right here. So we want to use this neural network to emulate a second order nonlinear system. So basically we want to find the value of WI so that the Y star it's very similar to the Y on the governing equation up here. So we used about 10 seconds of data to do training and then another 10 seconds to do validation. And here's the final result. So time is horizontal axis again. The dash line is a target output according to the governing equation I, show you, I just showed you early. And the solid line is the output of a reservoir. So you can see the origami can kind of mimic the dynamics of a different nonlinear system with a pretty good accuracy. And if you work in the field of artificial ne neural network, being able to achieve this kind of emulation is a direct proof of the computing capacity of a neural network. So basically we show that yes, origami can be used as a reservoir computer. It's, you know, it can be used as a physical neural network. But you know this is cool, but it's not that useful for mechanical system. So we decided to do another experiment of using this origami reservoir to directly predict what's going on in, in this working, working environment. So for this case, we put small payloads, small mass on origami reservoir. And then the idea is that if you have different payloads on origami, or maybe the payloads at different positions, the dynamics of the origami will be different. And as a result, the computing capacity in origami should be able to predict how heavy is the mass or where is that mass without using any specialized sensors to do this, which gives you the dynamics to do this. So to do the mass, like a weight of a mass observations, we have to go through two different steps. We have to put a training mass on the top and train the structure to give us a readout weight so that the output is the same as the first training mass. And then you have to put a different training mass on top of it to get a scaling factor, and they can use that to predict the mass of other payloads. So here's the sum of a result. The horizontal axis is time, and the vertical axis is uh, the output of origami reservoir. And different lines right here, they are result from different payloads. And if you take an average, you can get the prediction of origami in terms of the weight of that payload. And here's the final result. The horizontal axis is the real weight of these payloads. The vertical axis is the predicted payload from origami, and then ground truth is blue line, and different curve right here, that will result from different excitation frequencies. So you can see that the origami can use its dynamics to directly tell us how heavy is that payload mass. And then we also did one more thing. We put the mass at different locations on the origami, and then so we can train the origami to give us a negative one, 
if the payload is on the left end at the position A, then we train the origami to give us a one if the mass is on the right hand, right end, position H. And then you, we can start to put, you know, different kind of payload at different positions. And here's the result. So the vertical axis is the weight of the payload. And the horizontal axis is the real position of that payload. And the different color right here represents the prediction from origami in terms of the payload positions. So if it's a red color, it means the, the origami thinks the mass is on the right. If it's a blue color, that means the origami thinks the mass is on the left. So you have a pretty good correction rate in terms of the prediction of the payload positions. So basically, you know, the computing capacity in the origami can help us to feel where the payload is or where, uh, how heavy the payload is. And think of that if you have a spatial space structures and you can use this vibration to directly do lots of sensing by using the kind of rest of our computing idea. So I have a bit more, but then I don't want to do what too much. I want to leave some time in the end for discussion, but then I want to show you one last example where we can use the origami to also generate first doses locomotion gauge. So this is the case where we can use origami and use its mechanical, uh, uh, use the reservoir computing capacity to generate a locomotion gauge. And this is the case, again, we're not using any uh, controllers. We're actually using the computing uh, capacity within origami structure to generate locomotion gate and generate uh, limit cycles. I can talk more later if you are interested, but I want to leave some time for discussion in the end. And, uh, but what we're going to do in the end is that we want to advance this kind of raise up our computing idea into more high-end intelligence. Because in our case, we think intelligence involves observations, like you know, observing, uh, estimating the payload mass, decision-making, long-term memory, and also executions. And in the traditional robot, if you want to achieve this kind of intelligence, you have to equip the robot with lots of different sensors and send those sensors into, say, a, com uh, a computer. So all the intelligence is in the sort of in the, in the digital domain. But with the risk of our computing, we might be able to outsource some of the intelligence directly into the mechanical domain. And with that, we might have, you know, we can use simple sensors and we can also have a higher sort of, uh, um, uh, let's say, higher efficiency in control overall. So that is the three different projects I just go over today. And if you want to take have some takeaway messages out of this, is that origami is a very, very fascinating research involved lots of different facets. And you have people in engineering, people in material science, robots, solid mechanics, mathematics, they all work on origami. And today I talk about origami dynamics, the vibration that actually adds a very interesting dimension to this field. But in the long term wise, if you want to make sure this field can be successful, we have to make sure we have people from different people, different aspects working together. So, you know, people from space research and people from material science research, they can all work together on this origami related research. And then we can make sure this topic can survive or flourish really in the long term. So I have to say thanks to my students. You know, without them, I cannot make this presentation ha happen. And uh, in the end, I would like to show this. Keep calm, the origami. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your time. And uh, yes, if you have questions, please. Yeah. 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 Any questions? Or I'll try to keep the volume up. And anybody that's online, do feel free to, uh, to speak up. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a question on the material for the um, when you did the ones and zeros and the ones and that that type of um, structure was that made with paper or did you have a more like rigid material uh, that you're using? Yeah, so the one that one was used pretty thick uh, nylon sheets, nylon plastic okay. sheets. Uh, there was no limitation. I can use paper as well, but then the frequency of this bang up is also related to the material selection. So if you use paper, then you might end up with a bank up being very, very low at the frequency. And then maybe the laser cannot pick it up. We also thought about using uh, metal as well. We can just have very thin metal piece. We can do the stretching. We actually did that. We actually tried this out. Uh, we can get bank up by theory, but again, if you use metal, the frequency get a lot higher. And that went out of what we can do with our test uh, test facility back in Clemson. So maybe we can do that here at, at the BT because we have 
better with laser scanners. So, but then, yeah, so with Kirigami or Origami, uh, you have lots of freedom to in terms of material selections, as long as you start from a thin piece of raw materials. Yeah. Yep. I, I can throw out two questions. I'll yeah. throw the easy one first. When you showed the uh, the neural network origami computer, yeah, you mentioned using you tracking software to track the dots. Yeah. And yeah. Having done that a little bit, I know that with that many dots and the tracking software that I use, that would have been a painfully long process. So I'm just curious what tracking software was used to, ah. to get that many dots. We actually we use the BATLAB, just image processing in the okay. BATLAB program. And it works out okay. It takes up time to process it, especially when you have lots of videos to process. Mm -hmm. But then uh uh, but I still have to use the right color, green co green marker oh, yeah. in the back in the red colored origami, so the the, the camera the track bit can see it very easily. Uh, then it was able to do it in the end because it okay. works in the end. I know I, I had sort of a, a freely available tracking software that I used, and it took like five hours to track twenty seconds of video for two points. Uh, so I saw that. And I was, uh, I guess it's, you know, oh. yeah, it depends on the color, the size, and yeah. there was lots of finicking to get it right. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sure. And then I, I think a more abstract question. Um, I, I spoke with someone recently who does a lot of robotic control mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the electronic domain Yeah. Um, using, you know, multi-sensor feedback loops mm -hmm. to do things like have a robotic arm grab something. Yeah. And, and we had a conversation about whether or not sort of mechano, me mechano intelligence, that I don't think I actually use that word, could achieve some of these kind of functionalities. And he, he made the assertion that um, that mechanical intelligence or material level properties can only really do very specified tasks, right, exactly. whereas you need robotic control mm -hmm. to do things that are very generalized. So I was curious if you have any thoughts on that. That's kind of a assertion. really good question. Um, so we went through two different steps. The first thing, when we were looking at the local motion robot, and it was like really cool, just like, you know, back and forth, you can just get local motion data out of this. And we thought about well, well, what else can we do with that? And we realized that it gets really hard because when you have the mechanics, it's hard coded in the structure. Mm -hmm. You cannot do anything beyond that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the limitation. And that's pushed us, us into this idea of reservoir computing. The reservoir computing, you have mechanics, you have vibration going on, you have stuff you know, in the mechanical domain, but it's also very easy for us to interface that with electronics because you, you, know, you have to use sensor to get out the reservoir state, you have to add them together. So I think what we can do is that the better way is to do combine maximal intelligence with digital one together. Not like just use mechanical only, right. you cannot replace it. No, you can't do that. But if you find a good way to do a balance, like you can outsource some of the simple controllers, simple control tasks direct, directly to the mechanical domain, like locomotion generations, mm -hmm. then you can free up the electronic controller or computers to do something more high end, like, you know, uh, you know, pass planning and stuff like that. So right. you have this kind of a hierarchy of different control. And then the lower hierarchy can go to the mechanical domain. That's probably the way to go. So yeah, just it's sort that. of like a combining under actuation and mechanical intelligence into sort of the generalized tasks through advanced computing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's like a hybrid approach is eventually the way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I never say I want to replace a uh, complete replace controller by what we have in the mechanical domain. It's not going to work. Yeah, there's so many way. times I want to complete re completely replace yeah. controllers. <laughs> Some people get to the discussion. So what was talking about is about computers. I'm like, why do you do computer again? Because you can just use CPU chips. If you want to just do computers, because people back in 1950s, they were trying to make mechanical computers. Mm -hmm. Like, they were actually doing that right now. They actually make material. They can do two plus three in that material. But then it was like, why do you want to replace it? It's better just to put them together and integrate them together. So that's the philosophy well of approaching. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Any any other questions online or Sam or Ian? Yeah. How many people online? I don't even know. It's only two other. Two. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So this is actually kind of surprising. That's okay. Yeah. So um, we are you know. We're at space VT. We're interested in doing things, building technologies for space. How, are there just general question? Do you see any crossover to any of this work in the space domain, or are mm -hmm. there like I 
yeah, I, I, I don't know. Like, is are there any immediate things that come to mind when you think of taking maybe taking some of these things for space structures yeah. or? I think so. Some of this may not be directly like applicable to space structure directly because you know you're not doing soft robots in a. I don't think you are doing lots of soft robots in space yet, but then uh, lots of the fundamental theories uh, or studies we have right here can be used for space structures. Because like when you go to space, people like to use origami to do deployable structures. Mm -hmm. You know, like we showed in the video early, and then but then. When they start to deploy structures, what is going on with the dynamics of that deployable structures? Because once you deploy it, it's going to have some vibrations for sure. And then how is that deployable structure going to behave in a space environment? Uh, we have the knowledge and tools to do that simulation design. So, so I guess, you know, when you have, basically the idea is that if you have a deployable structure design for space applications, and we can help you to understand the mechanics and dynamic side of this, if you need to know about that. So we have series, we have high fidelity simulation series. Well, actually we came out with, we just, uh, we are wrapping up paper right now. We just made our own higher kind of accuracy FEA simulation code for large deployable structures with multiple degrees of freedom with facets and joints combined together. And then we have, we just made our sort of like own FEA model to do that simulation with high accuracy. So yeah. Um, we uh, so that's that's why I think I really like it to work with you guys because I know origami is used a lot in space station with lots of interest like the people we show us but there are lots of stuff they run out like what I was saying you know at the beginning of the presentation mm -hmm. lots of it is just about design like you design you make sure you can have a very small compact like you know um, area or volume after folding but then the actual process of deploying especially dynamics. This is kind of open. Nobody really knows how to do it. And then this is a place we can come in and say, hey, we can help you to 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 understand what's going on with the deployment. Yeah. yeah especially with uh, maybe you're saying this is the attitude running controls that is if you start swinging open a large thing, how does that yeah you're still you're in a free you're not on ground or right. Yeah. Hey, hey, how I do this and I stop. Is that like stop turning around? Yeah, right start, right yeah. start spending something or, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That, so, because I, I saw a video, uh, was uh, that's uh, with that no the 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 the, the video I showed you already with a deployable solar panel. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one they actually look into you know this structure. They want to try to make it happen to deploy that, and they realize that once you deploy that, everything starts to like wipe it up and down like this, not stop. And then mm -hmm. and then because you know because you when you deploy that, I think they use like a spring loaded system to deploy that, mm -hmm. and it's very large scale. It's very slender, and in the end, just like the whole thing is like up and down. Non -stop. And there's no like damping. There's no damping side, yeah. and then they stop it because the people who work on this is on design domain. They just don't know how to deal with dynamics. Right. So so like, I mean, I, if I, I can help you to do that to, to kind of control how much uh, dynamics you're gonna 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 happen, right. and then and then um yeah yeah yeah. So cool. yeah, so that's so I think uh we can definitely talk more because I have that video, uh, those papers. I can look at it. Maybe we can sit down and see like uh, brainstorming like with my tech. Because if you look at deployed structures and then really dynamic side of this, origami dynamics, there's like two or three groups who really know how to do that in the whole country right now. Yeah. And then, and then so I think there was something we can definitely help to yeah. move forward. Yeah. And I know um, Scott Bailey is really interested in deployable optics. Okay. So a lot of deployables in space for like solar panels and for like um uh like radio and, and antennas and arrays and that sort of stuff. But optics, there's an even stricter ah. re requirement on the stability. Right, right, right. And a more would involve more like a dynamics analysis and stuff. So. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, I definitely see that particular area. But just in general, I think if I definitely think space is unique for things that unfold because you can only launch in a certain size. Right, right, right. And you know, it it you know you you can have something that's light, but if it doesn't fit in that size, then you yeah. also can't launch it. So right, that right. like if you want big structures, you have to unfold. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. So so uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure there's a on the fundamental level, there's lots of things we can link together. Comes dynamics and vibrations. Yeah, I think cool. there was maybe one question that was going to pop up online. I, didn't, I see we have a couple of people online. Uh, any maybe maybe interrupt here and uh, anybody that has anything online to uh, to ask. So 
Okay. We're yeah. done. All right. Um, yeah, with that, uh, thank you so much thanks. for joining us. Yeah, thanks. No um, and thanks for joining us here in the room. Um, we'll have another seminar here in two weeks. I think it'll be another hot process. Um, uh, seminar, which is another one that they've been looking a lot into a deployable structure, but just in a very simple, and that's an interesting one because they're trying to do it in like a cube set. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. But that's a, like a very simple, like just to get a little to get out in and out. Uh, so just, you know, in, 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 as a starter. Um, but yeah, they certainly could, you know, expand upon that. But um, yeah, so we'll have another um, uh, seminar from, from the Unforsat team here in two weeks. And uh, otherwise, we'll see you then. Yeah, cool, cool. All right.